friends we will continue our discussion on understanding the background to the right to information law in india by understanding at the outset what has been the contribution of the right to information in strengthening transparency so this is probably in terms of putting the reality check of the contribution of rti because we think rti is one of the instruments that has strengthened the rule of transparency and accountability and has contributed to good governance but i think it is not good the sole tool or agency that will actually ensure transparency and good governance however rti has been a, a kind of an inspiration in enacting several other legislations in india post 2005 and some of them that i can just highlight over here for uh, understanding the impact of rti and understanding the evaluation of the right to information is a law called the public service guarantee act in fact you will notice that it is called the public guarantee of service to citizens act uh, in many states uh, however the law that i'm referring to in the slide is a 2011 legislation that was brought in the state of karnataka there were many other states i think around 16 states have already enacted such a legislation which is in line and tuned to the right to information act in karnataka this law is also called sakala which is actually rendering public services to citizens and it actually is modeled on the right to information act now if you look at uh, the right to information act the purpose of this legislation is to actually give you information from the government and let me tell you information is a kind of service that the government has towards its citizens however there are so many other services that are also important to be delivered or guaranteed to citizens apart from information these services could be services like a birth certificate a death certificate a driving license and so on and so forth and hence to actually guarantee citizens that apart from information which is you know promised under the right to information act apart from information being a fundamental right right now and a legal right and apart from having a mechanism to render that kind of information to citizens it was important that states realized that other kinds of services can also be guaranteed to citizens in a time bound manner and i think if you look at these state legislations they are modeled on the right to information act and i think right to information act was kind of an inspiration for states to come up with such a law uh, interestingly more than 400 services uh, in the state of karnataka are guaranteed in a time bound manner under this legislation of 2011 called the public guarantee of service to citizens act that i think is an important uh, aspect of strengthening democracy strengthening good governance because i think what is important is that public services from the state must be rendered and delivered in a time bound manner and i think the government has to show some kind of accountability if the services are not rendered in time bound manner and thereby a penalty is going to be imposed individually and personally on the officer who has either delayed or denied that kind of service to the citizens and i think the model of rti gets almost interpolated into this 2011 legislation and i think that's an important uh, contribution that rti has done. Uh, second is the visit door protection act of 2011 it's actually 2014 uh, uh, but this law is you know a kind of a law that uh, has you know instrumentalized uh, based on the right to information act uh, because uh, you know who are whistle blowers whistle blowers are somebody who uh, actually expose corruption whistle blowers are employees who know that there is something wrong that is happening in an organization they want to actually expose it they want to actually bring it out they are people who actually want to fight against corruption and who want to bring in transparency however unfortunately in india we do not have a legislation that specifically protected the interest of whistle blowers i think if you look at the law the idea is that whistle blowers must have protection because they are people who are sharing information which are probably not shared otherwise who are sharing information that are not available in the public domain and who actually tend to expose corruption and bring in more transparency and accountability of the system and hence a special law to protect their interest a special law to uh, you know uh, give them protection in terms of uh, their identity in terms of who they are so that they don't get targeted or, or exposed or even murdered for that matter uh, and their life is not at risk and hence 
the law on whistleblower is something that is an extension of the right to information act and you will notice that uh, uh, NGOs, civil society, public spirited individuals who were behind the enactment of the right to information act uh, continued their uh, uh, you know people's campaign as I would want to call it in bringing the whistleblower protection act as well because they thought if RTA has to be instrumental and if you have RTA activists who are seeking information, they will act as whistleblowers. They will try to expose corruption uh, by using the information and trying to bring in transparency and accountability. And hence, unless there is a law that protects their interest, their lives will be at risk. And hence, the Whistleblower Protection Act is uh, uh, an important extension of the Right to Information Act movement as well. Uh, I think. The, what the Right to Information Act has also done is strengthening uh, two agencies that I think are very important and instrumental uh, in ensuring transparency of government, especially the central government. We have agencies like the Central Vigilance Commission, we call in, in short CVC, and the Comptroller and Auditor General of India, in short the CAG. These two agencies are important in terms of what I call as the watchdog principle. Interestingly, you know, in India, we always talk about you know uh, the checks and balances that the government requires and the checks and balances cannot be within the government they have to be external they have to be autonomous they have to be independent they have to be fearless of what they do and i think after the enactment of the right to information act the way the cvc has functioned and the cag has contributed uh, in probably exposing some of the scams or corruptions that have happened to name uh, a prominent uh, uh, scam the 2g scam I think uh, uh, the CAG has played a very critical role and the CVG is a monitoring agency about how probably uh, you know a public authority or a public agency actually goes and performs its public function. Uh, the CVC Central Vigilance Commission keeps an eye on public expenditure, on uh, uh, public awarding of contracts, uh, on how probably public institutions uh, go about the fair uh, and uh, reasonable rule. And I think these two agencies have just got their strength because I think the citizens now are also an additional watchdog under the RTI. Earlier, it was only these two agencies that had the uh, role to play. However, I think through the enactment of the RTI, the CVC and the CEG also get a kind of a strengthening provision. And I think RTI has created that major contribution as well. Next, and probably the last, um, is you know the instrument of what we call as the ombudsman or the Lok Park. I think, you know, in a state like Karnataka, uh, we had a Lok Ayukta and it uh, continues to be a very supreme agency to check corruption uh, as well. And it has performed extremely well. Uh, and uh, the Lok Ayukta has been very effective in, I think, two states, Madhya Pradesh and Karnataka. And I think uh, that is kind of a check that uh, has uh, on government uh, machinery and government functioning. Any person, any individual, any citizen can complain to the Lokayukta about any matter of corruption. And the Lokayukta has the power, uh, police power of investigation and prosecution as well. And hence, this is a special agency that will actually check um, uh, corruption. And I think this is an agency that can demand information from the government. And I think what was there in the states in terms of the Lokayukta, I think the central government uh, decided that it was important to bring in a Lokpal. And the same thing was initiated in 2003, though this has taken some while for it to be, uh, you know, fortified, concretized and implemented as well. However, one will not forget that in bringing the low call, it was a people's movement, it was people's demand uh, that actually forced the government to bring in an ombudsman called the low power. However, I think again, like the Whistleblower Protection Act, like the Public Guarantee of Services Act, I think Lokpal and Lokayukta only will strengthen the right to information movement, which will ensure transparency, accountability and good governance. I think these are the natural extensions of the journey on transparency in India. And I think it's a journey that has just begun and commenced. There have been significant contributions of each of these legislations. And I think uh, all of these will probably go ahead in bringing about good governance, especially in a democratic country like India, and will also strengthen the democratic principles and also protect uh, the larger dimension of human rights. Friends, internationally, right to information has got recognition uh, through instruments to which India has been a party. India has played a very significant role in these international uh, instruments or international conventions. 
and i think uh, from those international conventions india had a uh, 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 obligation to bring in rti law um, quite some time back however we couldn't get it for many reasons uh, probably there was no internal demand for the same there was no external pressure and i think india did not comply with the obligations that were set out in some of these international conventions uh, again you know uh, in many other countries as i would uh, suggest in terms of comparative law uh, in other countries rti is called freedom of information law in india we call it the right to information law so it is the foi law as we call it as against rti law i think both go ahead to achieve the same purpose uh, but i think in india we did decide to call it the right to information act as well what are these international recognitions of rti we will talk about just three instruments which are very relevant to begin our discussion upon the first is the uh, ungc or the united nations general assembly uh, did make this declaration saying that freedom of information is a fundamental human right and kindly note this declaration was made in the year 1946 and a general assembly resolution was passed to this extent and it said that uh, freedom of information is the touchstone of all freedoms right and i think uh, when india became a member of the united nations i think it was obligated to actually recognize this as a human right however when our constitution was adopted we did not bring this explicitly we did not mention it however we did try to uh, follow most of the un uh, declarations on human rights and i think the courts uh, later on tried to bring this or interpolate this into right uh, uh, or fundamental rights under the constitution of india so as early as in 1946 one would notice the un general assembly makes this declaration that freedom of information is a fundamental human right that's something that we should keep uh, note of secondly uh, we had the united nations declaration uh, on universal declaration of human rights as it's it is called udhr in short in which we had article 19 which expressly states something like this it says everyone has the freedom of opinion and expression very important uh, and the same freedom is uh, enumerated under article 19a of the constitution of india what does this freedom of opinion and expression uh, hold it says that this right includes the freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek this is important and to seek receive and impart information now the fact is that you cannot exercise your freedom of expression or opinion or speech unless you have sought the relevant information uh, regarding the same and hence you will notice that in india while we say that uh, there is right to information we have always seen right to information as a part of freedom of speech and expression and this is exactly where uh, you derive the interconnection of free expression free speech along with the right to information act and look at it what it says it says and to seek receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of any frontiers i think very important is the fact that your expressions will not be full unless you have the relevant information to make those expressions and hence the integral aspect of freedom of speech and expression uh, is the right uh, to seek the appropriate information so information only enhances my expression it makes my expression far more authentic it makes my expression far more free it makes my expression almost that much complete last but not the least look at the international covenant on civil and political rights again an international instrument uh, to which india is a party and it's a very important uh, declaration that was made uh, in 1966 and article 192 of this covenant states very important thing everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression this right includes the freedom to seek receive impart information and ideas of all kinds regardless of frontiers either orally in writing or in print or in any form of art or through any other media of his choice so it's just uh, probably clarifying what was declared in udhr the same principle gets clarified in the international covenant civil and political so i think the international recognition on the right to information is uh, probably a key to how probably india had an international obligation and that obligation uh, finally uh, saw the light of the day uh, by enacting the right to information act uh, more than you know almost after 40 50 years uh, through the right to information act of 2005 so these are some of the international recognitions of 
Right to Information Act or the right as such. And I think India has just gone about implementing its uh, obligation uh, as well. Next, let's move on to the genesis and evolution of the right to information law and policy around the world. Um, I think, um, how did the world react? What, what, what is the world view on uh, right to information law? I think we'll just get uh, an idea or capture that imagination about the world response before we try and uh, in detail understand the India response. Now, Sweden uh, probably had a law in 1766. And if one tracks, uh, you know, which country had a transparency law and which country had the first transparency law, you'll obviously get into the answer of Sweden. And I think uh, they had this law quite uh, early in advance. And you will appreciate that some of the Scandinavian countries uh, have, uh, uh, you know, ranked top in the least corrupt nation index. So, uh, because of the kind of laws they had enacted quite early on, uh, the governments uh, in those countries, Sweden, Denmark, Norway and Finland, always have um, rated very high. And uh, because of the transparency laws that they enacted quite early on, uh, corruption is uh, far more or less as compared to other countries as well. So Sweden takes the lead in uh, uh, having law on transparency and openness. And I think what it ensured was good governance. So transparency law and the final good governance has uh, a very important link as well. Around the world, again, if you um, take statistics and start checking uh, about uh, how many countries do have law and when did they have it. Till 1990, you will notice that less than 20 countries had a transparency law. So what was declared in UDHR, what was declared in ICCPR was not really followed by uh, nations and uh, countries and nations, though they were democratic, did not enact transparency law or the right to information act. So till 1990, less than 20 countries had brought right to information act. But after 1990, things changed drastically and dramatically. I think uh, there was uh, enough people's movement, there was enough international pressure for states to act um, because states could not uh, just merely ensure freedom of speech and expression. They had to go one step forward and also ensure the right to information act. And hence, you will see that between 1998 and 2010, 60 countries brought about a transparency law. So there was this international kind of uh, a movement uh, which actually states and nations did emulate and did enact and take this forward and they realize the importance of the right to information act in a democratic setup and hence 60 countries joined in uh, to bring in some law uh, either a rta law or a transparency law so you know together if you uh, calculate it was quite a huge number how the world reacted uh, in getting the rta act and please note during that time among those 60 countries was india as well right at this point of time uh, just to ponder, I have just put out a question to you so that you guys uh, can all uh, try and relate uh, the discussion so far. Um, but I think uh, I'm sure by this time, after uh, uh, these many hours of uh, course instruction, there would be an itching thought within your mind uh, to raise this doubt. I have raised it so that we can address this question. Whether the RTL law is a public grievance redressal law, right? Um, I think, you know, very often than not, we have a tendency to believe that through RTI, I can redress all my grievances. All my problems will be solved through RTI law. So RTI law is probably the mother of all solutions. Once this brings in, I think all problems are going to be solved. The answer is absolutely no. So these countries did realize that RTI law is not a public redressal law or public grievance redressal law. It is only a law that brings in that information that is required from the government. It brings in an accountability structure between uh, uh, the government and its citizens. So it's not a public grievance redressal law. It will only help you uh, uh, lower the kind of grievances public have because there is no more openness. There is more information that is flowing. However, when public have grievances, we have to set up redressal mechanisms. That has to be through the courts, it may be through quasi-judicial forums, it may be through the complaint mechanism, 
but i think rta just facilitates that because uh, it only gives you that kind of information that will help you redress the grievance uh, sooner faster speedier but i don't think it's uh, uh, you know it was uh, meant to be a public uh, grievance redressal law in any country right so rta is an information law and it's not a public grievance redressal law at all so countries did realize this however they said that i think uh, uh, one of the most important grievances that citizens obviously have is the lack of information the lack of openness the lack of uh, accountability and an rti should actually have uh, facilitated that and uh, i think uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know gap uh, between the citizen and the government is bridged when this information is shared right so in that sense i think rta is a facilitative tool to uh, lower the grievance to address some of the issues of grievances of the public but it does not act as a redressal forum it does not act as a redressal law uh, and hence that is not the purpose of enacting any transparency law uh, around the world right um let's go forward now what do i have in this slide is very interesting uh, i have a chronology of freedom of information law uh, that have been uh, brought about worldwide so that you will get an idea about uh, uh, the major nations across the world who have brought in an rta law or a transparency law and in which year they actually enacted the same we'll start with sweden this is something that we already discussed 1766 then you have colombia uh, 1888 uh, uh, this is a latin american country as we know it it's a transparency law that was brought over there. Finland, again a Scandinavian country, uh, 1951. Then you had the United States, 1966. So the Americans did bring in their freedom of information law quite early uh, um, as compared to uh, other nations. It's quite an effective law in the United States as well. Denmark and Norway brought it in 1970 and France in 1978. So these are you know just an idea about how nations reacted how they brought in a transparency or freedom of information law so that worldwide we get a perspective of what is happening when it happened. Uh, down south in Australia and New Zealand, it was 1982 that uh, the law came into place and Canada in 1983. So I just listed some of the uh, major nations so that we get a fair bit of an idea. However, when you look at 1966 United States, when you look at 1982 Australia and 1983 Canada, I think uh, somewhere India uh, was slow to react and bring in a legislation and uh, interestingly it took nearly uh, 9 to 10 years almost for people to convince the government the need or requirement of enacting an RTI. So it was a struggle of 10 years uh, literally uh, to convince the government of the day uh, to uh, convince the government saying that what is the role and importance an RTI will play. Uh, in a democratic system and how it will contribute uh, to good governance and to bringing accountability as well. Um, so major nations probably uh, brought a transparency law quite early and probably you know if you look at their kind of progress growth um, you know uh, the kind of GDP that they have achieved or the kind of accountability that those governments have shown probably because they enacted such a law quite early I think uh, there has been far degree greater progress that has made in those countries. It's something that uh, may strike your mind at some point. Yeah, India, 2005. So, way behind uh, some of the developed nations uh, in bringing a transparency. Right, so I think a fair bit of an idea about uh, the chronology of freedom of information law that is enacted in different nations and uh, finally as compared to India, right? Right. So this is something just to give you an idea and a brief uh, background about the scene. Now, uh, again, by simple mere uh, statistics, you can uh, see India became the 61st nation uh, world over to bring in a freedom of information law. Right. So 60 other nations had a law before India. India is the 61st country to enact a uh, law on freedom of information. So though we are the uh, fifth or sixth largest economy, a nuclear power nation. When it came to enacting transparency law, I think we were slightly behind uh, many other progressive nations. Uh, but I think it's, it was never too late. 
I think we have seen the uh, benefits of the Right to Information Act in the last 15 years. It's been very, very significant. Right. Um, what does this uh, photograph show you? Um, I just want you to think some uh, few seconds. What does this uh, photograph show you? It shows you that this is probably a shopping uh, mall or a shopping area or it could be an area at an airport or it could be an area at uh, a railway station. And uh, what do you see over there? Don't see ICE. Uh, you see this I. Right? And I think what you see over here with I is this is the place where you can get information. Right? I stands for information. So when you go to a new place, when you go to a new area or a new, you would probably want to know where is what. Uh, and uh, you would want to go to a reception. You would want to go to a lobby. And uh, you would want to then probably ask A, B and C. Right? Isn't this natural? Isn't this normal? So if you are not accustomed to that place, you would actually benefit from information. So I stands for information and it's very important for uh, any service provider, any place to actually have a place where people can come and seek that information. Right? It's very important. Uh, so when you travel to a different country and as soon as you land in the airport, you'll have numerous questions to ask. Uh, where will you find the taxi? Where can you exchange currency? When can you get a SIM card, a mobile phone? What does a place like an I do? It probably tells all those passengers, all those incoming uh, uh, citizens or people that this is the place where you can come to and this is the place where information will be provided. Today with the digital world, you can get information on the internet. Uh, you can just Google it. However, please know, uh, sometimes you are not uh, sure about the authenticity of those information. You would still want to physically go and speak to a person at a place where there is an I mark where information can be given to you and information can be shared. 